Welcome to Worldwide Bible Class. I'm Pastor Brian Wolfmuller, uh, but I'm not teaching. Luther's teaching today on the life of Jacob. We're in Genesis chapter 31, verse 16. Let's get after it. Here we go. So uh, we are, oh, this is this great section that I, I've been waiting for this for a while. Uh, this is where uh, uh, Leah is going to steal the idols from Laban, her father. Or Rachel, Rachel is going to steal the idols. And what's going on there? What? Why? Why does she want these idols? That's the question that we're going to have. Uh, but we, so we have J uh, Jacob. You know, he's he, he's he's under the tyranny of Laban all these twenty years. He's he, Laban has basically stolen everything from him. He hasn't. He's he made him work. The Lord has finally come said, "Look, it's time for you to get out of here." So he's going to leave, which is great. Uh, but. Um, but it takes all this stuff to, for to even to get him to leave. But then he's going to wait till, till Laban is out shearing the sheep, and then whoop, off he goes with his stuff, headed back home. So here we are. So Genesis 31, verse 17 and following. Here we go. So Jacob arose and set his sons and wives on camels, which is kind of cool just to picture and to imagine. You know, here they I mean, this is real Middle East kind of stuff. So they've got horses and donkeys, but camels are what you really need. They're, they're the they're the off-roaders. And he uh, he drove away all his cattle, all his goods, which he had gained in Mesopotamia. Padam Aram is the original Hebrew here. That's the region. To go to the land of Cana to his father, Isaac. So he's headed home. Isaac, oh, how old is Isaac by this time? I mean, 170 or something. Again, the text confirms that this plundering was truly uh, divine uh, and a reward owed for the toils of Jacob. For he does not call it spoils, theft, or rapine, but calls it goods. So his goods here, this is the thing that Luther's going to notice, is that is that the Lord is giving approval of what Jacob is doing. Taking all these things, he doesn't call it theft. Now, we're going to get theft in a little bit. We're going to have to wrestle with that, but in the, in, at least here, it's okay. Uh, all is yours, the wife said. It's spoils given to you by God, which you are tearing away from the jaws of greedy Serbius. Cerberus. Cerberus. Some, someone probably knows exactly who Cerberus is. This is one of these references to old Greek tragedies, which, which Luther knew so well. Uh, the text adds, to go to his father... That's here to his father, Isaac, as though it meant to say he did not plan to run away like a kidnapper, thief or robber, but was undertaking a legitimate journey to his father, Isaac, where he could live in greater safety and render an account of his journey and his goods to all men, whether Laban or others who wanted to drag him into courts and accuse him of theft. If indeed it seemed unjust to depart in secret and to withdraw all his property unbeknownst to Laban. Thus we too, and and this is uh, Luther had talked about this for quite a bit, and I think we two three weeks ago talking about how the Lord provides for the church through theft, which is a really interesting thing. And he and it's theft because the world doesn't want to give up its goods, and so the Lord sees to it that they that they uh, that the that the world uh, has to support the church even unwillingly talks about the spoils of Egypt. Thus, we too can enjoy the spoils of the world with a good conscience, although we must snatch our food from the claws of harpies, the world, and the devil, for they hate us and say that they have no need for pastors and ministers. But God says to the contrary, I have need for the church, and you are my ministers. Therefore, enduring wrongs and tyranny, for endure wrongs and tyranny for my sake. This is an interesting thing. Uh, the world says, uh, well, first of all, the world hates us. And they have no need for pastors and ministers. Th this is important for us to just remember how, mm, what, how the the idea that the church would be esteemed by the world is a delusional idea. It's a. I was talking to the guys. I was talking to the guys down in Australia about this a little bit. How. Um, 
you know how you remember when you were in high school and the, like the thing that mattered was was how the people who were who were known or who were popular or whatever were how, how you wanted to be thought well of by them your reputation is the thing that mattered and there are certain people who for whatever reason had a rep you wanted to be cool with the cool kids basically but then you got into college and that started to wear off and then you graduated because you met people like you and they you had friends and the, the you know the cool people do their things and you nerdy kids did uh, are the nerdy thing and that was fine and then you go, grow up and you get married and it's and you have a family and and now you it's not so important what the world thinks of you well there's something about that theologically like we just have to be like you you just got to kind of you grow up a little bit and you realize that you're a nerd and that the world is always going to think that you're nerdy they're never going to like you they're you're never going to be part of the cool kids and that's fine it's it's good actually it's the the whole being part of the cool kids was a was a was a false misleading dream to begin with well there's something like that with the, the uh, theology to recognize that we're we're never going to be part of the world and there's nothing that we can compromise to help that. The church could give up every single doctrine, every single commandment, every single article of the creed, every single, we could give it all up, one after another after another, conceding to the world, and the world will never be happy. The devil will never be content with us. There's never going to be a peace treaty, <clears throat> excuse me, between the world and the church. There's never, no one's, oh, now we like you now. You can't, there's, you can never concede doctrine. The if if you concede a doctrine, the thing that the church likes is not that you've changed your is that you are conceding. That's the only thing the church likes, and you'll concede, 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 and there'll be nothing left, and then and then there'll be nothing to concede, and so then the church, will, the world will hate the church again. Anyway, how come we're talking about that? Oh yeah, how the world hates the church. This is how, this is how this goes. That um, it's it, it's just what Jesus promised. In this world, you will have trouble. They hated me before; they hated you. So the world hates the church. The world thinks they have no need for pastors and ministers. This is a big deal in our own time because the conversation is starting. You hear rumors of it more and more and more, and it has to do with, for example, the tax exempt status of the church, and the tax exempt status of the church has been challenged and. And it's stood up for a while, but it's going to, that's going to, that challenge is going to come more and more hard and fast until I think, I, I can't imagine that the church will have tax exempt status by the time I'm, I'm finished living uh, and serving as a pastor because, um, because the argument comes not only does, is the church not good for the world, but in fact is bad for it. Why are we helping funding what the world considers to be a terrorist organization? God says to the contrary, though, I have need of the church, and you are my ministers. Therefore, endure wrongs and tyranny for my sake. I will take care to distribute some spoils among you. I will give you a good prince to offer you lodging. I shall not give you the world as I have given it to the Turk, and likewise to the Epicureans and usurers, before whom I must set the wealth of the world and whom I must fatten for eternal fire. Woo this is an amazing thing that... That those Luther sees the wealthy, those who have all the treasures of this world, as the Lord is kind of fattening up for the judgment day. Oof. But to you, Christians, I shall give a small portion, which would be like spoils. If it involves you in great trouble and toil, consider that I have torn it away from the world like the possessions of Jacob and the spoils of the Egyptians. There you go. Okay. So Laban, in the meantime, verse 19. <clears throat> Now, Laban had gone to shear his sheep. So it's to observe carefully. Luther's going to Luther's gonna take note. He, I mean, he's trying to pay careful attention to all the words here. And so he's going to see this phrase and just meditate on the wisdom here. That the, the fact that Jacob waits until Laban is gone, a couple days journey, out to the flocks to shear his sheep. And that's when he's going to hit the road. It's to be observed carefully that Jacob does not tempt God, but seizes an advantageous occasion to avoid the offenses which he could escape. For dangers are not to be invited, but avoided. I don't know who needs to hear that today, but here it is. Dangers are not to be invited, but avoided. Maybe I need to hear it. 
<clears throat> we don't look for our crosses. The, the Lord will appoint them at, according to his will. So we're looking at places to be careful. Although we have the word of God on which we can and should safely rely, nevertheless, of itself, it loads us with many great dangers. Now, look at the, the I don't know what Luther means here. I know what he's saying. I, the word of God loads us with many great dangers. So you don't have to go looking for dangerous stuff. You open the Bible, and you're in a dangerous spot. Now, what is he talking about? I'm not sure. It could be. Here's some options. It could be that some Matt says he just canceled a skydiving appointment. <laughs> well, you know, and just do the safety checks. Let's not get carried away here, Matt. I think uh, I think you should. But this is the, that when we have the Word of God, number one. We're set apart by the Lord Jesus with his name and with his kindness. And so um, so the devil is attacking us constantly. That could be the first danger. It could also be what Luther is talking about here, that, that when we trust in Christ, uh, the world itself hates us. And so it'll be attacking us. There'll be persecution. This could be it. It could be that the just the, the 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 work of being a theologian sets us up for affliction. It tenderizes the conscience in such a way that we're fighting against our own flesh in profound and different ways. It could be what Jesus says: um, you have to, if you're going to follow me, you have to hate father and mother. So, so that it, it's going to set up this challenge of of. Um, obedience to God versus making the people around us happy or whatever. Anyway, the word itself loads us with many great dangers. And so other unnecessary dangers are not to be invited. Nor should we snore in ease and smugness, but natural wisdom and industry should be used. Natural wisdom and industry. Now, we remember that that Luther has a very interesting view of reason. But that's going to come up here uh, again, and and we're going to be able to think about it. Because on the one hand, when it comes to theology, reason is dangerous. Reason has to be in submission to the Lord and his word. But reason is also understood as this great gift from God to sort out how to do things best. So natural wisdom and industry should be used, and likewise human counsels and help so that we do not seem to tempt God. We should be smart. Mark says, shrewd as snakes and innocence as doves. That's right. Jacob could have said, I have the word and the command of God, therefore I shall go forth from this house and care nothing about Laban's fury and indignation. But under his very eyes, while he is in a rage, I shall leave this house and take along his daughters with all my property. This would have been rashness and unnecessary presumption and tempting God. <coughs> If, therefore, you have the word, you do well when you obey it. But prepare yourself to use those things which are at hand according to the word. So that, and again, we get into what we want to remember as the, the ministerial use of these things, not the magisterial use. So when it comes to, when it comes to reason, so we have the word of God, which is first and primary, and then under it, we have our reason. This is the ministerial use of reason because reason is a minister to serve the word. The opposite would be if we put reason above the word, and this is what we call the magisterial use of reason, of reason, that reason is a ruler and a magistrate that rules over the word. We say, no, no, that's not what we're called to do. We're called to, uh, to, to use our reason to serve the word of God. We, we believe in the ministerial use of everything by the way, not just the word. We, For example, the ministerial use of feelings. This is a very important idea for us to think about now in our own day, because we, we want to have a magisterial use of feelings, that how I feel, it, it kind of rules over things. No, 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 no. Our, the, our feelings have to serve the word of God, so that when our feelings match the word of God, when we feel, for example, forgiven of sins that we repent of, then we rejoice that our feelings match. When we don't, when we feel like as if God has abandoned us, then we know that 
Well, that doesn't matter because the word of God says, I will never leave you or forsake you. So it's the word over our feelings also. it's This is when Jesus says, you should love the Lord with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. So that all that we are, heart, soul, mind, and strength. All of these are in service to the Lord Jesus. The ministerial use of the heart, soul, mind, and strength. Matt says, is it fair to say that using our reason in submission to God's word is considered biblical wisdom, or is wisdom something separate? That's a great question. I I think there's something separate going on. There's a there's an earthly wisdom and there's a biblical wisdom, and those two are different from one another. I think what Luther's talking about here is earthly wisdom in service to the word of God. So the word of God is heavenly wisdom. Let's just do it like that. That's wisdom. And then there's other stuff that we figure out. Like, for example, hey, Laban's shearing the sheep. It's going to be harder for him to pounce on us. Let's go now. And so then there's earthly wisdom. And But that has to be, that's a little bit different. And that has to be in service to the word. <clears throat> Excuse me. Okay. So. Uh, if you have the word, you'll do well when you obey it, but prepare yourself to use those things which are at hand according to the word. Amber says, don't we use our reason to understand the word of God? How do we avoid the danger of putting it above the word? Well, this is, so that's exactly right. Our reason is, our, oh, this is let me draw the picture again. This is a great question, Amber. How, so this is, a, how do how do we do that? How do we make sure that our reason is, if we're using our reason, how do we make sure it's not above the word, but under the word? So um, it, 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 it is like, I think it's like this. We have Here we have the things that are true. And those things are told to us in the word. And I use my reason to say, what is the word? How does the word give me truth? The dangers, I say, no. My reason determines what's true apart from the word or around the word. No, reason says, what does the word, reason does not ask what is true, but reason asks, what does the word say? And that's the difference. So for I'll give you an example. Um, in the question about the Lord's Supper, the Anabaptists say, that it can't be the body, the radical reformation, it can't be the body and the blood because that doesn't make sense to our reason. And the Lutherans say, no, reason says that the words of Jesus are, this is my body and Jesus can't lie. And so we listen to the word, even though our reason can't comprehend how it could be true. Hopefully that's helpful. That's a great question really and really important distinction. Okay. Um. So we have the uh, so we have the word. We're preparing to use those things, which are at hand according to the word. So he had the command, Jacob, for, about leaving the land, returning to the fatherland. He had the promise concerning God's protection that he should not fear, however great the danger would be, however varied the difficulties that would be thrown in his way, concerning which mention will be made below. Nevertheless, he waits for an opportunity and a time when Laban is a three days journey from home to shear his sheep. He argued as follows. During these three days, he will not be able to reach me, nor will he be able <clears throat> easily, will he easily make the discovery that I've left. In the meantime, I shall complete so much of the journey that he cannot reach us on the first or the second day and cause a disturbance. So Jacob seized a very fine opportunity with singular prudence and wisdom. For so God has given us reason and all creatures and all our temporal blessings to serve our uses. These things should not be despised. The man who wants to travel will require provisions for his journey from which he may secure food and lodging for himself. But he would act very foolishly if he thought that he had no need of money or food and that everything would be offered him on all sides by the providence of God. In other words, pack your bags. God has created all things that are necessary for this life, not that you should expect them from him directly. Now, this is the this is the danger here. How does God give his gifts? We, ex we expect all things from the Lord, 
but he doesn't give us all these things directly. Now, sometimes he does. Sometimes he makes the bread rain from heaven, but not always, not mostly. In fact, mostly he gives these things to us through the people that are around us. That you should enjoy those things that are at hand in the order which he himself has prescribed. So this ordering of things is very important, and it's going to be very important when we get down here to the theft of the household gods there. So we have to observe the order of things. And so we don't just use our pure, bare reason, but we use it according to God's word. Mm. Constrained by God's word. By no means, therefore, should the use and the ministry of creatures be despised, since indeed God has created them to serve us. This, this despising of the of creatures, one of the marks of is one of the marks of Gnosticism, remember? Gnosticism despises everything earthly. It's all unclean, unholy, wicked for the Gnostics. All the material world is 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 uh is terrible. And 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 so there's this temptation towards Gnosticism. In fact, Luther knew it really well because the Gnosticism that he faced was this monasticism which wanted to live this angelic heavenly life on earth. And um, it's a bad idea to begin with because it doesn't have the word of God and because it takes you away from these things that are good. Okay. Now we get to this crazy part. Rachel stole her father's household gods. This is another crime. Luther says, Rachel steals the teraphim from her father. But please behold the ingenuity of the woman. She argues as follows. Everything we possess has been violently taken away from us and retained by our father. And now it has been torn away from him by God as though it were spoils and handed over to us. Therefore, it is permissible to take away all that he still owes us. But to me, as the lawful bride, he should have given some gold or silver ornament, but because he has not given it, I shall take it secretly what he should have given of his own accord and by every right. So here's the, the logic that Luther fills in for this act of Rachel. Now, the word theft that's used here is the word theft. So Moses is not holding back from calling this a breaking of the seventh commandment, nor does he hold back about this. that it's an idol, that it's a household god. This is what's going on here. So, <clears throat> but there is some logic to Rachel's activity because like everything else, Laban has should have given uh, some sort of ornament for the marriage price, but he doesn't. He doesn't. Now, what does Luther make of all this? We know, and here's, here Luther's going to wrestle. If you if you want to if you want to come to a different conclusion than Luther on this, of course you're free to do so. One of the things that we want to do is wrestle through his wrestling through it to see how he thinks about it. Because on the one hand, he doesn't want to underplay the sins of the father. He wants to see them clearly when they commit sins. He wants to see them clearly, and yet he wants to assume that they're living as Christians. And wrestling to do the right thing. So let's see how he does it. In the first place, the holy women and Jacob sinned gravely against the fourth commandment by accusing their father and father-in-law of neglecting the duty of love toward his daughters. Now, <clears throat> Luther's saying that when Jacob and Rachel and Leah make all these accusations against Laban, they're breaking the fourth commandment. Of course, they're right. The accusations that they make are correct. He was a greedy thief who did all this stuff, but he was also their father, and so they're sinning against the fourth commandment by doing it. But they didn't have a choice because of the first commandment. This, this is we'll, we'll see. This is a very hard charge, and Moses himself, in a way, seems to be in conflict with himself, since he says in the fourth commandment that parents should be honored and also that they're eccentric, uh, how do you say this word? Eccentries, that's wrong. Well, I'm saying it wrong. And weaknesses should be endured. Eclecticness. Ec ec no, I'm, I'm getting two words mixed up there. Anyway. 
But in this place, he relates an example of the patriarch Jacob and his daughters that is plainly contrary. So how can, well, and then it's going to be the seventh commandment. They seem to have forgotten all respect for their father and as much as they show themselves so hard and ill disposed toward their father and all their vehement and fierce accusation. The second sin here, so this fourth commandment is that they're already plotting against Laban to do all this stuff. And now here's the second sin is that Rachel steals her father's idols, teraphim, <clears throat> eccentricities. That just sounds funny. Did I say it that right? I said it right, but man, that word sounds funny. Eccentric. <clears throat> eccentric. We say someone's eccentric. She steals her father's idols. The Holy Spirit does not shrink from the word, but uh, steal but clearly says that Rachel, a holy woman and wife of a holy man, while believing God's word and exhorting her husband to depart according to it, stole the idols. Teraphim. He does not simply say she took away, removed, but she stole, contrary to the seventh commandment. So now we have. So now we have the, the the not only do we have a fourth commandment breaking, but we have a seventh commandment breaking. You shall not steal. But if it's not permitted to steal from a neighbor or a stranger, how much less from a father? And she steals what her father considered most precious and dear in his house, the gods which he worshipped. Now we know, we go back to Laban, remember he was, he said, I did this divination and determined that the Lord has blessed me because of you and all this, so that he had these idols that were in the house and he was this real pagan guy. And so she steals those pagan idols, that's crazy. Although it has been previously stated that much weakness adheres to all the saints, which I do not like to excuse. In other words, Luther says, I, I don't want to make, I don't want to, um, I don't want to make excuses for them. When they sin, I want to see it as it is. So it's, I don't want to, I don't want to make excuses. Yet, it must be added that Rachel's father ceased to be a father because of every kind of cruelty and tyranny. For he regarded his daughters as outsiders, deceived his son-in-law so often, and indeed thought of keeping his son-in-law and daughters in perpetual servitude. Therefore, Rachel had a very just cause. This maybe is the this maybe is the point here. Rachel had a very just cause by civil and natural law for seizing the idols, as has also been stated above concerning Jacob. But there is also the first table. So, so Luther's saying, even according to the fourth commandment and the seventh commandment, you could make a case that this theft is justified. It's also been stated above. Yeah, yeah. But then he's going to say, but there's more to it than even that, than just the justification, which there was reason for. There's also the first table. Now, remember what Luther's talking about here with the tables of the law is the, um, the, the Luther, uh, uh, well, no, Moses, uh, when he gets the Ten Commandments, has two tablets. And these are called, these tablets are sometimes called tables. And we divide it into first through third commandments and then fourth through ten. So this has to do with God and his name and his word. The tenth, the fourth commandment, you love your neighbors yourself, or your, it's a father and mother. Sorry, the second table of the law is love your neighbors yourself. So this has to do with God, and this has to do with the neighbor. And so when Luther's talking about the first table here, he's talking about the first commandments, first three commandments, which have to do with God. And we have the first command, the first table, which establishes decree degrees between the commandments relating to God and those of obedience in accordance with Christ's statement. He who loves his father and mother more than me is not worthy of me. In other words, sometimes we have commandments in conflict with one another, and we have to give preference to the first table of the law over the second table of the law. Accordingly, Jacob and Rachel are righteous not only by virtue of the second table, they were justified in what they did taking the stuff, but are also by virtue of the first table. <clears throat> For when obedience is to be rendered to God in the second table, 
then obedience to parents and obligation to all precepts ceases. The first table takes precedent over the second. Let's see. Luther's going to expound on this. And we've had this before. It's been some months ago when we had this before. But this is a, a general, and he's going to dig into this because while this is true and very, very important, it's also very dangerous. When we start to set the law, we because what one of the things, sometimes we have to break a commandment. This is the point. And the reason we have to break one commandment is because we have to keep another commandment. So, for example, if you have parents who tell you to go and steal your neighbor's horse, you disobey your parents because we have to obey God rather than man. Do you see? So so when the commandments come into conflict with one another, you gotta, you gotta, you're trying to pick. When the Pharaoh tells the Egyptian midwives to kill the Hebrew babies, they not only disobey his command, but they lie to him too to do it. So we so there's times in this life where the commandments are set against one another. So you have to know which ones, which ones take precedence in which circumstances. So that's what Luther's going to be wrestling with. And you see the danger here. Because whenever you're justifying breaking one of the commandments, you're in a very dangerous spot. You want to make sure that you're doing it rightly. For when the obedience is to be rendered to God in the second table, then obedience to parents and the obligations of all precepts ceases. Much more is this so when the authority of the first table is involved, that is, when God orders something by a new word. <laughs> Thus, the saintly people had a word of God announced through the angel. Rachel and Leah rely on it when they say, all the property which God has taken away from our father belongs to us and our children. And do according to the word which God has spoken to you when he testified through the angel that he knew all that Laban would do to you. So they have the word of God in verse 16. This is this is what Rachel and Leah recognize. All the riches which God has taken from our father are really ours and our children's. So this comes from a word. This is a word of God that they have. So that they so that they can act now according to God's word. Moses, moreover, says in the blessing of Levi, Deuteronomy 33, a really curious text, that Levi is blessed because he said of his father and his mother, I regard you not. And then follows up and says, They observed the word and kept the covenant. That is, he who wants to serve God is not obliged to obey the precept of the Decalogue concerning the honoring of parents. What is this? Why then does Moses make this law if in another place he ordains the opposite? For these matters are diametrically opposed and are a real anti-logia, logiae, contradictions. The answer is that when the first table, and here's the rule, when the first table gives instructions concerning the worship of God and obedience to him, then the second table must yield, and one must say to father and mother, I do not know you, I do not obey you. For example, you can imagine a, a, a parents who say to their children, you cannot be baptized. And they have to say, well, look, I have to obey God rather than men. At some point, you have to obey God rather than man. Or uh, whatever. You can't go to church. You can't read the Bible. <clears throat> Men complain that in this way, political... Now, this rule is a complaining rule. It's a hard rule. And so Luther's going to take up some of the objections. Some complain that in this way, political and domestic obedience is destroyed. In other words, if I don't have to obey my parents and the, those in authority, I can just re reject their authority because of God. And this reason the gospel gets such a bad hearing and is called a seditious doctrine as the title of the cross of Christ indicated, Jesus of Nazareth, king of the Jews. In other words, here Jesus claims to be a king, and the bad thing about that is that he, he wasn't a king, but he's claiming to be a king, and that's the danger of the gospel, is that it, it, it makes men disobedient to other authorities. The point is only if, only if those authorities are governing against God, but Oh, well, that's maybe the point. In the same manner, also, the doctrine concerning this king is called seditious and contrary to the second table, 
because it says that obedience should not be rendered to the magistrate and the parents and indeed gives orders and speaks ill of them. As Rachel says of her father, he's our foe and our enemy. What could be said that's more seditious? Or I shall not obey magistrates, parents, etc. What dissipation and confusion in all things will arise from this? So here's the objection to the rule. And Luther says, I reply that the obedience which God enjoins in the second table must certainly be shown. So we're not undoing the second table. We're not erasing the second table in obedience to those in authorities. But there are degrees of rendering obedience and careful, and I cannot, I don't think Luther can either, cannot overemphasize the carefulness needed here. Careful regard for them must be maintained. For if the first and second table come into conflict, the simple and correct method is that by which the second is ordered to yield to the first. For God is the creator, the head, and the Lord of father and mother, the state and the home. Notice here the three estates at work. These all must be subject to the creator. And when the question is asked, which of the two should be abandoned, the creator or the creature, I replied that the creature should be abandoned. For the first table takes precedence. And when it's been obeyed, then also the second table has its place. Then you should obey your parents and bear and suffer wrongs from them. But for me, says God, not against me and against the first table. Therefore, therefore, the simple and plain truth, let me erase all this and get down here, about Rachel's theft is that the first table repeals the second table. This command that God gave them to leave and take the stuff This is what's governing her. It's rightly enjoined in the second table. You shall not kill. But if the first table orders killings, the commandment of the second table yields. So also the seventh commandment about not stealing becomes invalid when God orders you to take what's your father's. So also the eighth commandment prohibits desire to curse and defame, especially in the case of parents. But the rights of the first table must be preserved. For if it orders these things, you should hate and rebuke parents as Rachel does. This distinction is necessary and very useful. It often happens that the heretics abuse it. So while this distinction is really particularly important, it also is easy to abuse. The heretics boast that they have the first table and under this pretext abolish the second table. Here there's need of careful judgment, for in this way the Pope also boasts that he has the first table and argues from that that no one is bound to obey the magistrate, but all owe obedience to, to the Roman see, to which even emperors and kings are necessarily subject. But see whether he teaches the first table correctly, and for what reason he cancels the second table. For in regard to the monastic profession, and this is an interesting test case, because monasticism is built on leaving your parents, leaving the family, objecting... Uh, 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 abstaining yourself from the fourth commandment. In regard to the monastic profession, they said that one should run to Christ, disregarding and scorning parents. The spiritual father should be listened to. There is extant, for example, a word of Jerome, if your father and mother met you as you were about to enter the monastery and they showed you her breasts and wanted to draw you back by their tears, despise the tears and trample your parent under parents underfoot. Flee naked to the cross of Christ. So Jerome. Now, Luther says, this is absurd. This is an ungodly and diabolical word because they abused sound doctrine to establish monasticism and the doctrines of demons. The matter itself and the doctrine is quite true. But you see, but see that you are a good dialectician and that you distinguish rightly between the first and the second table. Likewise, you should see if monasticism is truly a divine matter, if it's God's cause for which the second table should be canceled. If it is a matter or cause of God, then it is rightly stated, trample a mother's breast underfoot, despise her tears. But if not, remember that obedience should be shown to you with all reverence, and that likewise their faults and infirmities should be endured, provided only that they are not in conflict with the first table. Rachel had the first table on her side, for she was called by the word of God to leave her father's house. Her father sins not only against the second table, but also against the first. He's an idolater. 
all things that he has done hitherto, he has not only done with infinite cupidity and greed, but has also sinned by idolatry. And these two are the most serious sins of all. For although greed of itself is idolatry, there was still the additional worship of the idols, the teraphim. So that Rachel therefore prudently concluded, as she was a woman about 50 years of age, in accordance with the first and second table, I'm called to leave accordingly. I have the word of God. My father is sinning against both because he's an idolater and a greedy man. For up till now, he's not given me a farthing of those things which he should have given me by every right, human and divine. He owes me wages and gifts, even by virtue of the second table, not only of the first, because I'm his daughter. Accordingly, I will steal something. Yes, something that is going to cause his idolatry some difficulty, I shall st steal the teraphim. He is too grasping and mean to cast other images readily away. Therefore, in regard to the first table, I shall act rightly in taking away idols and overthrowing false worship. In regard to the second table, I shall be exercising forethought for myself and carrying off what was owed to me by every right. The Holy Scripture, however, calls it theft. Just as Christ mentions hatred of father and mother, he who does not hate father or mother or his own life, etc., which is forbidden in the law, hatred is. Although that's not really hatred. Putting things in order. Okay. So there is Luther's take on the theft of the idol, of the household idol by Rachel. It's an amazing thing, actually, to see how he deals with it. I'm just looking at the time, and this is probably, it's probably a good spot to stop right right there so let's um so we'll take up so so let me make a few concluding comments and uh and say a prayer and then we'll take it up here um luther's going to continue on this for a little bit uh uh and in fact he's going to talk about the, uh, oh yeah to talk about the pope uh talk about reason talk about uh, scriptures talk about a little bit more about it so we'll we'll have some more time to think about it a little bit more next week let me oh here's some chat um Gwyn asks, are we not supposed to point out our parents' sins if they sin against us? Are we supposed to accept it? So it depends a lot, or any authority, Matt adds, this depends a lot on the context. Uh, um, I suppose it depends a lot on the sin and on the, how things are, depending on your own age, your own condition with your parents, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the general rule, when someone sins against us, we have the... Matthew 18, we go to them, we take two others, we say to the church, it's a little bit different in the family. Um, if things are functioning rightly in the family, then we, we ought to be able to tell one another, hey, that that was wrong. That was a wrong thing. And probably we're handling in the family where it's one-on-one. -on -one, and then if if the person doesn't see the, the damage and sin that they've done, then we're taking more from the family with us and so forth. So it's almost like uh, church discipline, but in the family. But that's assuming that everything is working right and functioning in a healthy way. Um, if it's if it's if it's not, if the sins of the parents against the children are dangerous, then uh, other authorities want to get involved. If family authorities can get involved, especially grandparents, that's always the first option. Uh, but if that's not an option, then it's neighbors, pastors and so forth. So uh, Matt says, this discussion reminds me of arguments made in the church during COVID-19 for and against taking vaccines or masks when the government mandated them. There was a tension between the fourth commandment and the first table. That's exactly right. So this will also often happen that this tension will come up and we have to say, I have to obey God rather than man. Uh, now we have, so we, we have this inclination to obey those in authority, but the point is, that that obedience has limits and the limits is the is the word of god so if the word of god comes into play here then we must obey god rather than man that's the that's what it means to be a christian good all right let's close in prayer and then i'll shut down the recording and then you guys jump in and we'll catch up with each other let's pray oh lord we give you thanks for the wisdom and kindness of your word we pray that you would continue to bless and keep us through it uh, that you would teach us uh, your will, your ways, uh, that we would, uh, again, be wise in this world while we wait for the world to come. For we ask this through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.